For over 70 years, since I was a teenager, I've wondered about evolution and how it works. And somewhere fairly early on in the mid-1960s, I began to realize that evolutionary theory faced one big problem, namely a problem concerning big numbers. And I believe that problem has not yet been solved, and it's very important. Modern evolutionary theory, and we call it neo-Darwinism, as taught in biology classes, often implies that science can now nicely account for the great variety of living organisms on our planet. It suggests that we can account for increasing biological complexity over time by the natural selection of random mutations. That's neo-Darwinism. And hence, there's no need for an intelligent designer. Well, that counters the long-held conviction that, as the complexity of a watch clearly shows that it had a designer and a creator, so the complexity of living organisms also demonstrates the role of an intelligent creator, namely God. And this conviction is called the argument from design. We might expand it to say the argument for the existence of God based upon design of living organisms. Well, along came Darwinism, which eventually became Neo-Darwinism. Does it really offer an alternative to the argument from design as implied in many biology classes? Charles Darwin published his book in uh, 1859 on the origin of species. And some scientists then uh, thought that natural selection, which was Darwin's suggestion, did counter the argument from design. On the other hand, there were many who did not. As time passed, the mechanism of natural selection became better understood based on the discovery of mutations. And as a consequence, it became widely accepted until now that mutations are an important part of natural selection, and evolution. It's a mainstream viewpoint. Yet as discoveries about how life functions delve deeper into the molecular biology of life, a serious problem began to appear. I call it the problem of the big numbers. Most modern biologists seem to be in denial of the big numbers problem. They have to be well aware of it, at least in principle. But they pretty much ignore it and assume that it will someday be solved, that the argument from design will eventually go away. In this lecture, I want to follow first three stories. One, the argument from design and how it developed into Darwinian natural selection. These are very brief stories. They can be expanded greatly. And then number two, I want to briefly review how we went from Darwinian natural selection to neo-Darwinism. And finally, I want to give a little history of how molecular biology developed and got us to the big numbers. After that, we'll have some fun with the big numbers to illustrate how serious the problem really is. Right now, however, let's get things straight before we go any further. This lecture does not ask whether evolution occurred. The fossil record clearly shows a parade of increasingly complex life forms on Earth over a period of about 600 million years. And it looks at theories of how evolution might have happened, not whether it happened. The idea of the argument from design goes way back to biblical times and has been used widely. But a good place for us to start is in this very brief summary is the 1802 book published by William Paley in Natural Theology or Evidences of the Existence and Attributes of the Deity Collected from the Appearances of Nature. His argument starts in the first chapter, and it's uh, greatly expanded from the very brief thing I'm going to present here. He talks about a watch analogy, and uh, it was very famous then, and it still is. Say you found a stone and a watch by a trail. You might assume that the stone was always there, but it would be clear that the watch had a maker. Its design is what makes that clear. Couldn't have happened just by chance. Somebody had to make it. Incidentally, Darwin was well aware of Paley's book. He 
was aware of it from grade school all the way to his graduation from Cambridge University in 1831. So, Paley went on to suggest that if the apparent design of living organisms, plants and animals, clearly exhibits that they must have had an intelligent designer. That's the argument from design. Today, we might say that William Paley was an early intelligent design creationist. He certainly was. But some philosophers and scientists uh, disagreed with him, had other ideas. Here's just a few bare bones summary ideas. The notion that species develop by descent with modification, that is, by evolution, have been around for a long time. They were not individually created one at a time. Some thinkers and scientists accepted that idea. Most others did not. Most accepted the idea that they were created individually by God. But those who accepted descent with modification, namely evolution, played a role in our history. And it's important to note that Darwin didn't invent the idea of evolution. He invented one way that it might happen. Well, how could it happen? About the time of William Paley, a guy by the name of uh, Bap- uh, Baptiste Lamarck uh, produced a theory called Lamarckian Inheritance of Acquired Characteristics. Uh, giraffes reach higher and higher to get leaves, and as a result, they have babies that have longer necks. Well, that was, uh, it didn't really seem to be very likely. And it's now known to be false, with some tiny exceptions in the, the new science called epigenetics. So, how did we get to natural selection? Well, enter Charles Darwin. As a naturalist on HMS Beagle, Darwin studied plants, animals, and geology of South America, the Galapagos Islands, and some islands of the Pacific. The trip took five years, and he got to wondering on that trip about how species might originate by natural processes. In 1838 in London, he got the idea of natural selection, and he got it partly because of uh, he observed artificial selection in the production of domesticated plants and animals for agriculture. He told his close friends about his idea, but he didn't publish the idea for 20 years till 1858. In the meantime, Alfred Russell Wallace, uh, even as a teenager, He and a friend wondered about the species problem, uh, how species might originate by natural processes. And he spent eight years alone at the Malay Archipelago collecting specimens for sale in England. And one night, (laughs) in a malarial fit, he got the idea of natural selection. As soon as he got better, he prepared a paper for publication and sent a copy of it to Darwin. Well... What Darwin received the paper in June 1858, and it caused panic. He was afraid he was going to lose his priority as the inventor of natural selection, called in his friends, and they were able to think of a good compromise. And the compromise was that Darwin's ideas and Wallace's ideas were presented at the same meeting of the Linnaean Society in London. Well, uh, Darwin and Wallace... Uh, published their ideas. Darwin's Origin of Species was published in 1859. He went to work on a 2,000-page abstract that he had written and shortened it down to a, about a 500-page volume that uh, was published. Right now, I want you to note that Darwin knew nothing about the big numbers and virtually nothing about biochemistry in general. It's almost never mentioned in his books. And as we'll see in a minute, that's because very little was known about biochemistry at that time. And yet that's where the problem of the big numbers is to be found. Darwin and Wallace's individual insights about natural selection can be divided into into four parts, which are called the mechanism of natural selection. A, no two organisms within a population are exactly alike. All populations of organisms have some variety within them. Some are different than others. As human beings, we certainly recognize that. Furthermore, all populations have the potential to increase geometrically, that is, by compound interest. In short, they can grow faster than the food supply. And that leads 
with such rapid population growth to resources becoming limiting. For example, where do you get food? Where do you have space to live? Uh, all kinds of things. And so, on average, there's a struggle for existence, and those best suited to their environments will be the ones that are likely to survive. Not always do, of course, and, uh, but that's what Darwin and Wallace each came up with independently, the survival of the fittest, like this. We think that horses evolved through a bunch of natural selection stages that way. Namely, that natural selection will eventually lead to new species. Evolution will occur. Well, what's the origin of variety within populations? And will there be sufficient variety to account for evolutionary speciation by natural selection? Darwin himself wondered about this, and I see it as the main problem in evolutionary theory, as we'll get to. Now, beginning around 1900, uh, the work of Gregor Mendel was discovered by three others who had essentially duplicated the same work, and Mendelian genetics became a science. And based on genetics, it was obvious that there were several sources of variety. Genetic recombination, for example, and genetic drift. We were on our way from Darwinian evolution to neo-Darwinism. Spontaneous changes in organisms had been observed for a long time. For example, new fruit varieties appeared as a, as a branch on a tree, and these were called mutations. But we didn't really understand mutations until Hermann Mueller came along and showed that uh, X-rays could induce mutations, and he showed that in 1926. Happens to be the year I was born. And for that, he got a Nobel Prize, which uh, he had to wait about 20 years for, but he got it. We now know that ultraviolet light and certain chemicals and other environmental factors can cause mutations, plus some are simply spontaneous. And we now define mutations as changes in the nucleotide sequences and DNA. Uh, we'll come back to that. Mutations are now thought to be the principal source of variety for natural selection to act upon, although there are other complications. Evolutionary theory now says that evolution proceeds by the natural selection of random mutations, and that is called the new synthesis or neo-Darwinism, to distinguish it from the simpler theory of, of uh, Darwin and Wallace which didn't have any idea where the variation within a population came from. The big numbers are of profound importance to evolutionary theory, so let's take a look where they came from. And scientists may have wondered about the big numbers, but before the late 1940s, there was no evidence that there was such a thing as sequence information, which we're going to talk about, and which is critically important to understanding life and the origin of species, for that matter. Sequence information is how we got to the problem of the big numbers. And as noted already, it's my opinion that biologists have pretty much ignored the big numbers problem, although it has been around for over half a century. Let's take a fairly careful look at the history of how we got to understand the chemistry of proteins and nucleic acids, and therefore how we got to the big numbers. This is just to illustrate that uh, not much was known during Darwin's time. Proteins weren't even recognized as a distinct class of biochemicals until the late 1700s. Antoine Fourcre gets a lot of the credit for that, but there are others who are coming to pretty much the same conclusion. And they also knew that stomach secretions would digest meat and other things. So they had a little idea of enzymes, but uh, not really. Matter of fact, it would be a century and a half before this led to understanding of the big numbers. Meanwhile, Darwinian evolution and then Neo-Darwinism were being developed. Enzymes, as such, were discovered uh, in 1833, while Darwin was off on his Beagle trip. They were discovered by Anselm Hayen, who discovered the first enzyme, and called it such, I believe. 
uh, namely diastase, which suggests starch. And the atomic composition of proteins was uh, uh, not understood well to begin with at all. John Jacob Berzelius and Gerhardus Johannes Mulder uh, determined the atomic composition of several proteins and found them to be carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, and traces of phosphorus and sulfur. And essentially, all proteins had that same basic elemental uh, composition. And so they postulated one basic substance. And 1838, uh, when this was going on, is when Darwin got his first ideas about natural selection, which he didn't publish for 20 years. And in a separate laboratory at the University of Tübingen in Germany, Friedrich Meischer uh, discovered a weak acid in pus cells, and we now call it deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA. And incidentally, this was a few years before Darwin died, but nobody knew what it was. It was just something that had been discovered. We didn't understand anything about its chemistry. So how could Darwin know anything about genes? Well, really important was the discovery of Franz Hoffmann and Hermann Emil Fischer. They discovered the peptide bond that holds amino acids together in proteins. The chemistry of proteins was finally understood. And by the early 1900s, uh, Darwin is long gone. But now neo-Darwinism is developing. The idea of mutations and genetic changes is uh, coming into the theory of evolution by natural selection. Well, we didn't even know at that time that enzymes are proteins. James B. Summer showed that the enzyme urease, which you get from jack beans, incidentally, that that enzyme was a protein. Now, that's again the year I was born, 1926. That's pretty far along the line before we understood even that uh, enzymes were proteins. First time it was really clearly shown. Well, the next step was to show that what the genes do, and since genetics had been discovered, we know about genes, and what they do is code for proteins. And it was Edward Tatum and his student, George Beadle, incidentally, one of my mentors, who uh, showed that genes do code for proteins. And uh, this was the first inkling of what later became called the central dogma of molecular biology. Uh, Beadle and Tatum got their Nobel Prize in 1958. But a big question remained, what is the gene? It had been stated in the early 1900s that there were genes, but what were they? And it seemed logical that uh, since genes code for proteins, maybe genes are proteins. That was a very simple, uh, logical idea. But what about those nucleic acids? There were some who thought maybe the nucleic acids were the genetic material. But it didn't make sense because the nucleic acids are made up of, of just four uh, kind of uh, links in their chains, four nucleotides each in DNA and RNA, and that seemed too small to carry inheritance. So it was really hard to convince people that uh, genes weren't proteins. Finally, DNA was isolated as genetic material, and this was done by Avery McCloy to McCartney, and uh, they isolated DNA and saw that it would act as genetic material in bacteria. But that was only accepted by a few. The proteins as genes seem so logical. Uh, nevertheless, it was confirmed by Hershey and Chase in another experiment with viruses and bacteria in 1952. Still not accepted by everyone. Along came Friedrich Sanger, who determined the amino acid sequence uh, for the protein hormone, insulin. He got his Nobel Prize for that in 1958. He developed methods to sequence proteins in general, and in 1949, he published his first successes in showing that amino acids have a specific sequence in the protein insulin. So we're getting to the big numbers. And neo-Darwinism was alive and well, and 
still is. DNA, the double helix, was discovered at that time, 1953, by James D. Watson, Francis Crick, and, and Malcolm Wilkins, uh, who gets little of the credit for it, sadly. He deserves a lot. What they discovered was that DNA was a double helix. To me, Fred Sanger is the hero of this big numbers story. Let's get to know him a little better. He was born in a small village in England, 13 August 1918. He was raised a Quaker, but years later he claimed to be an agnostic. In 1940, he graduated from St. John's College in Cambridge, England, where he studied various sciences, including biochemistry. And he was awarded a PhD in biochemistry in 1943. Well, he stayed at Cambridge and began working with bovine insulin, which is a small protein readily available in pure form that's obtained from cattle. And it was used, of course, in the treatment of diabetes, even back then as it is now. In 1952 and 1953, he announced the final amino acid sequences in the two chains of insulin. And for this, he received the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1958. And there's a picture of uh, what he was given. Well, in 1976, he worked out a method to sequence DNA, leading to his second Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1980. That prize was shared with three others. Fred Sanger was the only chemist to receive two Nobel Prizes. After Sanger's work around 1950, the big numbers could finally be appreciated. He retired in 1983, but his DNA method, slightly improved, was used in several laboratories to sequence the entire human genome, more than 3 billion nucleotide pairs in the human genome. The importance of Fred Sanger's discovery really cannot be too much emphasized. The fact that amino acid sequences can be determined for one protein suggests that all proteins must have specific amino acid sequences. And indeed, uh, DNA and RNA must also have determined nucleotide sequences. All this was... uh, confirmed not long after the discovery. Fred Sanger died in Cambridge, England on the 19th of November, 2013, at age 95. And John Walker, uh, one of his close friends and a fellow Nobel Prize winner, 1997, he writes the following in a tribute to Sanger, written in Nature uh, not too long ago. Sanger's impact on biology is as dramatic as that of Charles Darwin. I believe that. The idea of natural selection, role, and evolution uh, was a tremendous discovery of Darwin and Wallace's, but we couldn't really understand the problems of natural selection until we understood what was being selected, what was changing, what was providing providing the variety that is essential to any kind of natural selection. And Sanger's breakthrough work is where we could begin to appreciate that. Well, so the big numbers question facing evolutionary biology, uh, consider Fred Sanger's bovine insulin. Uh, It's a small protein hormone. It controls the level of blood sugar in mammals. It has 51 amino acids, and nearly all of them must be in the right order, the right sequence for the molecule's active site to be effective in controlling blood sugar. Just as the sequence of letters in this sentence must be correct if the sentence is to have the desired meaning, information, it has been called. Well, it turns out that there's quite a close analogy between the written language, and the protein, and DNA and RNA languages. They depend upon alphabets, 
consisting of, uh, quote, letters, end of quote, amino acids in the case of proteins, that must be in the sequence. Yes, you could change a few of those, and it would still work as insulin. You could change uh, quite a few of the letters in the sentence down there, and, and the human brain would still know what it meant. But basically, the sequence must be right. If it's changed too much, it no longer is functional. The information is gone. So here come the big numbers. Using 20 kinds of amino acids, how many different molecules can be made that are each 51 amino acids long? Calculation is simple, although it's laborious. All you got to do is multiply 20 by itself 51 times, 20 to the 51st power. 20 times 20 times 20 times 20, 51 times. The answer is this uh, number, 2.2518 times 10 to the 66. And that is a big, big number. That's the kind of big number that I want to talk about. Why are these big numbers so important? Well, insulin's a good example, but there are tens of thousands of proteins in a living organism, each with a critical sequence of amino acids. Furthermore, life function depends on highly complex interactions of proteins with the nucleic acids, DNA, and RNA. The central dogma of molecular biology is the concept that in all known living organisms, sequence information flows from DNA to RNA to protein. Without the appropriate sequence information of amino acids and protein and nucleotides and DNA and RNA, life just won't work. Kind of an interesting side note is that the term central dogma was first stated by Francis Crick in 1958. He didn't realize that the term dogma refers to a religious teaching that must not be doubted. Religious teaching. So it didn't really very well apply to metabolism in living organisms, but it's kind of fun, and the term has become a catchphrase uh, that one sees every now and again. Well, let's look again at sequence information. First off, uh, let's get a little better idea of what an amino acid is. An amino acid has a nitrogen attached to one carbon. Nitrogen has a one or two hydrogens, depending on the acidity. And then it has another carboxyl group, a carbon and two oxygen, also attached to that carbon. And then there are 20 different kinds of things attached to that carbon. One of those things would be another hydrogen ion. That beats the, the very simplest amino acid. So that's the generic structure of an alpha amino acid in its unionized form, to be a bit technical. So what's the role of sequence information in protein? The order of amino acids in proteins controls the functions of the proteins. Proteins have several functions, but one function is the machinery of life. Enzymes are protein molecules that control hundreds to thousands of chemical reactions going on in cells. Those are the functions of life. It's machinery, you might say. And the function of each enzyme depends upon its sequence of amino acids. Well, we could talk about DNA and RNA also because they play a tremendous role in all this. They each have only four letters in their alphabets. They're shown in that upper right corner there, which I won't take time to discuss. But there are four kinds of letters in the alphabet of DNA and also four kinds of letters in the alphabet of RNA. Uh, actually, they are all overlap except one. How about the sequence information of DNA? Well, it's the arrangement of the four nucleotide letters of DNA in the sequence. And the great discovery of Watson and Crick in 1953 was that the nucleotide chains are arranged in the famous double helix, in which the nucleotide in one chain determines the nucleotide opposite to it 
in the other chain. Wherever there's an A in one chain, its partner in the other chain is a T. And wherever there's a G, there's always a C opposite to it. It's called complementary bonding. And it's a key to understanding life. Uh, Watson and Crick have made a tremendous breakthrough by discovering complementary bonding. And it suggests how reproduction occurs. As the double helix splits into two single strands, each of those strands can form a new double helix, just like the original one, thanks to the complementary bonding between strands. The function of DNA, then, is to carry sequence information from generation to generation. And that includes not only cell generations, but also generations from parent to offspring. DNA sequences are divided into genes. So many sequences in the chain make up a gene. And the nucleotide sequence of each gene will ultimately be translated into the amino acid sequence of a protein with its 20 different kind of amino acids. The function of RNA is to take part in that copying, which we call transcription, and the sequence of information from a single strand of DNA is copied into a strand of RNA, and the RNA strand uh, forms by complementary bonding with the single DNA strand. The second function of RNA is to take part of the translation of the sequence information of DNA into an amino acid sequence of a specific protein. Indeed, RNA actually acts like an enzyme in that translation process. But the purpose of this lecture is to illustrate the problem of big numbers, so we won't further consider how this translation happens, except to note that each amino acid in a protein is controlled by a sequence of three nucleotides in DNA and RNA. Uh, taking those four nucleotides, it's possible to arrange them, uh, taking three at a time, in uh, 64 different ways. And so there's plenty for the 20 different kinds of amino acids. It's important to note that each step of translation is controlled itself by an enzyme. That is, DNA, RNA, and proteins, enzymes make proteins, and proteins, enzymes, make DNA and RNA. Now here comes the big question. Clearly, those big molecules and proteins and nucleic acids are not only essential to life, those molecules and the things they do are life. Where did insulin and all the other proteins and nucleic acids come from? It isn't likely that they sprang into being by chance just at the right places and right times to do their thing, insulin, for example, regulating blood sugar. According to Darwinian natural selection, the only alternative is that they came into being one small step at a time, each step providing a little more survival value for the evolving organism. Well, yes, maybe that happened. But at this point in time, it is totally safe to say that absolutely no one knows how that could have happened. If understanding comes, it will be in the future. Nevertheless, now it's time for a caveat. The big numbers pose a real problem. At a certain level of evolution, the big numbers problem does not always apply. Often the gene with its big number sequence information may be changed slightly, only one or a few nucleotides, resulting in a change in development or in an enzyme such that noticeable changes appear in the mature organism. Like, for example, say a change in a gene that controls flower color. It may produce a new color. This can account for the many domesticated plants and animals or species varieties in nature. Small changes that were selected by natural selection. It's a process that works, that I won't deny. But it's easy also to think of big numbers cases where the problem does apply. The origin of life. Where do those huge sequences come from? And 
all of the sequences of protein amino acids and DNA and so on that currently make up a cell, how do they all get together? They're all required for the first cell, apparently. It's a mystery. Paleontologists have noticed for a long time, even before Darwin, that in the very oldest strata, there were new phyla, several of them, major groups of plants or animals. And they call this the Cambrian explosion. Imagine all the complex sequences of amino acids, DNA, and so on, that would have to appear and be selected to account for these creatures that uh, are in the background here. Uh, and they're typical. It's just not likely to happen. And there are many examples of apparent irreducible complexity. One of my favorites is ATP synthase. As far as we know, this molecular motor occurs in all active cells, producing ATP, adenosine triphosphate, for the energy that drives virtually all life functions. This little motor, and it is, it spins a thousand times a second. It's located in cell membranes such that movement of hydrogen ions through the structure makes it spin up to a thousand times per second. There are five kinds of proteins in this little machine. There's a total of 21 protein molecules altogether. Each molecule must have a sequence of amino acids that will allow it to perform its function and also to come together spontaneously as the proteins are synthesized. The motor, as far as we know, has to construct itself. Well, such a molecular structure certainly seems to me to be irreducibly complex. All those protein molecules or the DNA that controls them, with their huge amounts of sequence information, could simply not form by chance all at once. The big numbers are so big that the human mind can't really comprehend them. But it can be fun to imagine examples that illustrate how really big the numbers are. Here are some examples. I'll start simple. You may think you know the odds, but uh, most of us think we have some feeling for the chances of something happening, but the big numbers are often so big, they surprise us. We're surprised about how fast those numbers get bigger. Here's a simple example. How many ways can you arrange four books on a shelf? Calculation is easy. Four times three times two times one equals 24 ways. Well, let's add just six books to make 10 books. Now, how many ways can you arrange 10 different books on a shelf? Same calculation, only now it's 10 times 9 times 8 times 7 times 6 times 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 equals 3,628,800. 800 different ways that those 10 books can be arranged, and you can calculate it for yourself. Given any one arrangement, the odds of getting it by chance are just one in that big number, 3,628,800. I want to uh, make it very clear about how these calculations work, these alphabets want to review how we got the insulin big number. We need to be very clear about alphabets and how easy it is to calculate how many ways different letters can be arranged. Say that you have an alphabet made up of uh, 26 letters. How many one-letter words can you make with alpha that alphabet? Well, obviously, you can make just 26, no more. But how about two-letter words? All we got to do is multiply 26 times 26, so we get 676 different ways. And to make it clear, uh, this is how you get them. A, 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 B, A, C, A, C, and, and then B, A, B, 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 C, and C, A, C, B, C, 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 D, so on. You get how it works. It doesn't take long to add up the number when you start multiplying them like that. Three-letter words. Well, 26 times 26 times 26 equals 17,576. 
we hear about four letter words as though they were all bad. Well, multiply again by 26 and we get uh, almost half a million four letter words. Now, obviously, I know that those are not words because uh, words in our language have to have vowels in the right places and so on. But that's how many different ways you can arrange 26 letters taken four at a time. It's big fast, doesn't it? Let's return to Fred Sanger's bovine insulin. I uh, wondered how I could illustrate that huge number. 51 amino acids make up insulin and nearly all must be in the right place in relation to the others for insulin to be insulin. There are that many we calculated, multiplying 20 by itself 51 times. So uh, we got with that big number, and it had 10 to the 66th power on it. Let's uh, play with that number 10 to the 66. I imagine a cubic universe that has a volume of 10 to the 66 cubic meters. Well, a meter is about a yard, you know, so you can visualize about the size of that. And each of those cubic meters has one of the possible molecules that you can make if you have uh, 20 amino acids in a string 51 amino acids long. My universe would be 20, 10 to the 22nd meters on each side. And since light travels exactly 9 trillion, 460 billion, 730 million, et cetera, meters in a year, a light year is approximately 9.46 times 10 to the 15th meters. And I just soon round that off to 10 to the 16th for now. So a cubic universe with 10 to the 66 cubic meters is about 1 million light years on each side. It would take a universe that size to contain 10 to the 66 protein molecules the size of insulin if there was one molecule per cubic meter and no two molecules were alike. Our Milky Way galaxy is about 100,000 light years in diameter. So my imaginary cubic universe has room for our galaxy and a few others thrown in for good measure. And remember that in such a universe, each cubic meter could contain just one unique protein molecule of the possible 10 to the 66 proteins that are 51 amino acids long. Uh, there's that big light year number again. Oh, I forgot. There were 2.2518 times 10 to the 66 different protein molecules that are 51 amino acids long, the size of insulin. And so my imaginary universe, 10 to the 66 cubic meters, would really require 2.2518 of my imaginary universes to hold all those proteins, one unique molecule in each cubic meter of those huge universes. Well, here's an interesting, fun example that uh, uh, people have talked about for many years. Given a million monkeys pounding on typewriters for a million years, they would write Shakespeare, it was been said. Well, will they write Shakespeare or Moby Dick? So often said they would, but it turns out the chances of writing only one desired sentence are very, very small. Bob Berman in Astronomy Magazine did the calculation. More careful than some of my calculations, he took into account the different numbers of typewriter keys, and I guess whether they were uppercase or lowercase and so on. But he figured that it would take 2,100 trillion years for a million monkeys to have a 50-50 chance of typing, call me Ishmael, which is the opening sentence of Herman Melville's novel, Moby Dick. I worked up a different example using computers instead of monkeys and typewriters. And this was quite a while ago that I did this, but it still works. I said, let's write some Shakespeare. This above all, to thine own self, be true. There's the sentence. Here's the alphabet. We need to add a quotation mark, a colon, a space, and a period. Uh, actually, uh, that's a 30-letter alphabet. 
but I wanted another easy number like 45. So I have two spaces after the colon. That's what my type teacher taught me to do anyway. So doing what we did above, we multiply 30 by itself for 45 times. Let's try it. There we go. We do 30 times 30 times 30, and we keep going 42 times, and we get another big, 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 big number. Uh, our Shakespeare sentence will appear only once in all those sentences, which are more correctly called uh, strings, strings of letters in that 30-letter alphabet. How long would it take for a computer to generate that number of sequences? Let's let the computer make one billion changes per second. It'll take that many years. Considering that the universe is about 13.3 billion years old, that number up there is a long, long time to wait to write one letter of Shakespeare by rearranging letters in the 30 letter alphabet. Can you visualize that number? Uh, no, you can't. We can't. But we can get our feel for it by playing with it a little bit more. To start with, uh, there's my sentence, Shakespeare's sentence. I decided uh, one computer was hopeless, so I covered the earth to a depth of two kilometers with uh, one liter computers. And no two of those computers ever made the same string. And that reduced the time that it took to make all the possible strings to a mere 10 to the 29th years. But that's still way too long. So I uh, covered 10 to the 20th Earths with computers to that same two kilometer depth. And at last, it took only about a billion years to be sure that somewhere in that database, would be, quote, this above all, colon, space, space, to thine own self, be true, period, end of quote. Well, if you want to be precise, it was 936 million years, pretty close to a billion. I hope we're getting a better feel for the big numbers. But how could it take so long? I, I lay awake nights wondering about this, and I uh, imagined one way that it might be done, and that would be start out with this alphabet that. Uh, uh, I used 30-letter alphabet. Take each character of the alphabet and add the 30 characters to it. That's 900 combinations, 30 times 30. A computer could do it in a flash. But say the computer has done that kind of thing, adding 30 characters to each new combination of characters for 44 times. By then, it has formed 9.848 times 10 to the 64th strings. It's got to do it one more time. Well, it has to go through all of those strings, adding 30 characters to each of the strings to be sure that we get uh, this above all, but that our own self be true. For some reason, that idea helped me to imagine why it might take so long. Uh, wait a minute, though. Uh, we didn't write just one sentence of Shakespeare. We wrote everything that Shakespeare ever wrote. If you pick out the right strings from the database and put them together in the right way, the database includes all possibilities with that 30-letter alphabet. So actually, if you're willing to go to that trouble, you'll find that we wrote everything that anybody could ever write with that alphabet in any language that could use it. And of course, uh, most of the strings would still be meaningless in any language. Uh, languages have rules. You've got to have one vowel in a word. You've got to have space between words and so on. And most of the strings would be just gibberish. Now, does that give you a slightly better feel for the size of that database? Help me. So how did Shakespeare write Shakespeare? He certainly didn't hunt for strings one at a time in that gigantic database. We don't really understand how he did it or how we do it but it must not have been too different from how we write a letter or text a message. The language is in our heads. We learned it in some amazing way when we were small children. And then your brain creates an idea some way and you pull together words together to express that idea. I see it as a, a very mysterious, wonderful thing. It's creative intelligence, we can call it. 
And it works from the simplest note that we make to Einstein's special theory of relativity or his general theory of real relativity. Maybe someday we'll understand how it works, but right now we don't. Nonetheless, let's review why we're talking about the odds and the big numbers. For one thing, because it's fun to stretch your brain power, to bottle your mind a little bit. But for another thing, if we try to understand how life originated and how it might have evolved through all steps, big new groups of organisms appearing and so on, we immediately encounter those big numbers. It is truly an unsolved problem of modern biology. Life is extremely complex. Charles Darwin and even Herman Mueller didn't understand that complexity. We didn't really understand it, have it documented until Fred Sanger came along and worked out the sequence of amino acids in insulin. In my mind, that was a turning point in our understanding. Well, could all that complexity happen by random processes when life originated? No one thinks that it could. Fred Hoyle said that it would be like a hurricane hitting a junkyard and producing a jet airplane. Not a bad little idea. No one would argue with it. So the idea that life happened by chance all at once, long ago, uh, was given up. Can we beat the odds? This, of course, uh, is a topic for another presentation, but I don't want to leave with the idea that no one has worried about this problem. There have been a lot of people who have worried about it, and they have made uh, various suggestions to how we might beat the big numbers. One thing, we said that there had to be small steps of molecular natural selection. That's kind of a trite thing based on Darwinism. Another thing it was said that maybe small amino acid sequences might have enzymatic activity. Uh, maybe that would speed things up. Maybe not. Number three, can different large protein molecules have the same enzyme activity? Maybe they can. And if they can, that might speed things up. But it doesn't really solve the problem. None of those things really solve the problem. So add number four. Life might have been designed by the application of intelligence. And I don't think I need to argue for that anymore in this lecture. And yes, it is the favorite of our scientists supporting religion group. We think that design was involved in creation. Can't prove it. Uh, rarely can the methods of science be applied to the supernatural world. So it's easy for science to simply ignore the supernatural possibility. But please understand that this doesn't mean that the idea of intelligent creation is not true. It's just that we don't know how to study it for sure. Actually, there are ways we can kind of come close. But again, that would be for another lecture. Remember, Shakespeare used his creative intelligence to write his plays. And it's valid to ask, was life with its big numbers produced by creative intelligence? That's the end of my story. Thanks.